All right, guys, it is time to wake up those brain cells because we're gonna do one more video with the oscilloscope and get pretty nerdy this time. If you don't have an oscilloscope, this one may still be worth watching because it's kind of a really cool technique. And also we're gonna show you the power of nerdiness if you've got the right tools and some creativity. So let me tell you what we're gonna do. So I'm getting the Trans Am ready for racing weekend, which is generally a waste of time because I always seem to get staged up against some Honda boy that can't even run 15s. Hey man, I'm just testing my cold air intake, but next weekend I'm gonna slap a cam in it. But anyway, I need a break from this brainless bolt turning, so we are going to get geeky with the oscilloscope. And I'm gonna show you a couple ways to get actual, not just relative data that most of you guys are familiar with, and you've probably seen lots of videos, especially Scanner Danner, doing a relative compression test using the scope. But what I'm gonna do is uh, step that up a little bit. I don't know that I've seen this in any other videos, but I'm gonna show you how to use this guy to get actual PSI data for each cylinder and also numerical relative compression data so that you can see if you're within spec in certain situations. So for those of you guys that are not familiar with the relative compression test, it's basically a way to look at changes of amperage in the starter motor that relate to the compression and power strokes in the engine. So in other words, pretty much since this is an advanced channel, I imagine everybody that watches this has at some point turned over an engine by hand. And as you well know, there's some parts where when you get to the compression, it's really hard to turn the engine over, but then after you pass that compression top dead center, it's much easier to turn it over, and this happens on every cylinder. Well, the same thing happens to the starter motor. That's exactly why you hear that characteristic starting sound with the peaks and valleys a little bit, and that's because of the starter motor experiencing that same thing. So the thing is, just like you have to put a little more muscle into it to get it past the compression, well, the starter motor needs a little more amperage to get past that point. And using a scope, we can detect those peaks and valleys in the amperage and assume that the highest point of the amperage represents the highest level of compression. The idea is that we want to see that every cylinder uses the same amount of amperage from the starter motor at the height of its compression. So it's called a relative compression test. It basically is a way to just see that any one cylinder isn't much lower than the others. So if you're not familiar with actually seeing one of these before, let's go ahead and do one. So I'm just gonna set up my scope using my 40 amp low amp probe, and I'm going to set the amp probe around the cable the positive cable that goes to the starter. And actually, for some of you other guys, um, I actually have experimented with uh, going over the negative cable and even actually not using the amp probe and using the battery itself. And uh, while those work, I find that I get much more consistency and much cleaner signal actually on the positive. Maybe it's a matter of my settings, but I've tried pretty much everything. So this is my preferred way of doing it. Uh, let's zero that out and turn on the oscilloscope and I'll show you the settings that I'm using. Normally I like to use the two channel scope for this because I can put another channel on as for a point of reference from the ignition or something uh, so I can see which cylinder is which and uh, we'll do that later. Right now just to show an example here uh, let me show you what settings I'm using. You can do this a number of different ways. What I'm going to opt to do is use 40 amp probe set to 40 amps and uh, I think a one second scale will be pretty good. One of the things that uh, if I'm doing this for real that I'll do is maybe set a narrower time frame to get more detail and then zoom out from it. But uh, let's just go ahead and just show you what this looks like right now. And we'll go ahead and start the car. Okay, so now we're gonna go ahead and pause that and I can go ahead and play that back. So now I can go back and capture a shot where I've got all eight cylinders in the screenshot. And we can see that there's actually three problems here. So the first one is we can't tell which cylinder is which. And that's an easily solved problem that any of you guys who have done this before know how to solve that. You simply put a second reference on your second channel, like with an ignition firing or something like that, a, a fuel injector. 
Another thing you can do is loosen a spark plug and then repeat the test and then you'll have a point of reference if you know which spark plug you removed and then use that flat spot as your point. All kinds of ways to do that, but that's a minor issue. And we'll go ahead and we'll do something about that on the next run. But the second and third issues are quite a bit more concerning. One of the things is many cars, instead of having a straight out PSI requirement for a cylinder, what they will have is a requirement where the lowest cylinder cannot be less than a certain percentage of the highest cylinder. So for example, on this car, the lowest reading cylinder cannot be less than 70% of the highest reading cylinder. Well, is that within spec? We need a way to measure that. And that's going to be pretty easy. Now, the third one is going to be quite a bit more difficult. And that is, how do we know what the PSI here is? So in other words, because we're just looking at relative compression, well, the problem is, what if all of these cylinders are at, say, 85 PSI? Well, the problem is we don't have any way of knowing whether it's 85 PSI or 150 PSI. So I'm going to show you a way to go ahead and calculate that. But let's go ahead and take care of the percentage between the lowest and the highest first, because that's really easy. So all I'm going to do is go over here and pull up some markers. And we can go over to the lowest guy here and let's see he's reading 19.64 we can see marker one we've got 19.64 and then we can save him and then we need to go to the highest guy and it looks like the the highest guy actually is this one if I remember correctly uh, we can actually maybe it's maybe it's this one uh, that one we've got 2275 and I think this one's a little higher 2350 it is. Okay, so we can take down our differences here and then calculate the percentage between those cylinders. All right, so I would hope that everybody watching this would know how to calculate a percentage, but just in case you're in third grade, uh, we're going to go ahead and do this. And let's see here, 19.64 divided by 23.5. So we get 0.8. Three, six, so that's going to be 84%, well within spec, and especially considering this car isn't warmed up or anything yet. All right, so that's all good and fine, but the problem is we have no idea if every one of those cylinders is below the minimum PSI specification. So how are we going to figure that out? Well, that's going to be a little more involved. We are going to have to do some simple algebra and extrapolation. See, I told you this would get nerdy, but don't worry. It's actually very basic. But the first thing we need is we have to get a point of reference. So we are going to have to take a reading, an actual PSI compression reading on only one cylinder. Because we then have that point of reference, we will be, be able to extrapolate or use that point of reference to mathematically calculate what the PSI in the other cylinders must be since we have that compression data handy. So let's go ahead and do that. Okay, I think I've got everything in the shot set up here. So I've got my low amp probe, of course, on my positive cable to the starter as before. We've got two channels on the scope. The other channel is going to be for an inductive amp probe back here that I've got on the ignition wire for cylinder number one. So that should make everything easy. And that'll give us a point of reference on which peak is cylinder number one. Because we know the firing order, we'll be able to see what the other peaks are. And then, of course, a compression gauge uh, that I put on number three. So let's go ahead and turn this thing over and get our data collection. All right, so we can see our second channel ignition probe shows up here. So that means this must be cylinder number one. So that tells us what the other cylinders are. So going up here and using our little guides like we did before, we can go ahead and get our numerical data. So what I'm going to do is get our amperage data for each cylinder and we'll go ahead and write that down. And we can see that the gauge here reads about 170. So that's not too bad considering 200,000 miles on the car. Okay, so what I've done here is I have written down all of the amp data from the scope. 
And then also for number three, we've got our scope data, but also our hard data from the actual compression test. And incidentally, I did look up the minimum specification is 100 PSI uh, as a minimum. And then also, of course, as I said before, with 70% between the highest and the lowest. I could not find what a new engine specification would be, but having eight cylinders at 170 PSI, I'm happy with that. So let's go ahead and show you how we're going to calculate now what the PSI is for the other cylinders now that we have their relative compression data. The way to do this is to use a proportion. So if you're not familiar with this uh, simple algebra, I'll go ahead and walk you through it. What we're going to do is we're going to say 170 PSI is to the reading of 22.4 on number three, and that will equal X because we don't know the PSI for number one. And we are going to say as that is to its reading of 22.6. So then we just cross multiply and that's gonna be 22.4 X equals, and we have to cross multiply here. So 170 times 22.6 is 3842. And then solving for x by dividing by 22.4, we get 171 and a half. So about 172. So 172 is going to be the actual compression for cylinder number one. Okay, so let's go ahead and just do one more in case you didn't follow along with the math there. But what we're doing is 170 is to 22.4. We'll do number eight as to X is to 23.07. So cross multiplying 22.4 X equals 170 times 23.07. Okay. So that's 39.22. And then solving for X, we get 175. So the PSI here should be 175. And you can see we can go down the line and we can get all of our data for every one of our cylinders to get the hard PSI data. All right, one of the little tricks that I did is I actually made a macro for Excel so that I can just use Excel, type in my original data here for my known cylinder, type in my variables, and it just automatically comes up with the calculations real quick. But the math is pretty easy here. Now there's one last thing we have to do though, one last thing. And that is being a scientist, we have to show that this method actually is accurate, that this method is actually reliable. So what we have to do is pick one of these guys here and then see that the actual compression does show up with our calculation. So uh, looking at the engine, actually I can just see the spark plug for number one right here. And we already calculated that actually. So the calculated compression for number one is 172. So what we need to do is put our gauge into number one, crank the engine over and see if we get close to 172 so we can test the accuracy. Okay, we can see that the gauge reads, man, just a tad above 170, about 172. Amazing. All right, I feel rejuvenated after that awesome brain exercise. But now I got to get back to my basic bitch stuff. So anyway, thanks for watching. I hope you found this helpful. We'll see you next time, and it will be without the scope, I promise.